Good afternoon and welcome to this Open Sensors webinar, uh, Making Hybrid Work a Reality. This is episode two in a series of webinars that we're doing, which is exploring the changing nature of work and the impact it's going to have on our workplaces. Um, probably the, the, the best place to start is introducing myself. So I'm Chris Moriarty. I'm the uh, chair for this webinar. Um, I was formerly of the Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management, but today I spend much of my time looking at how workplaces are changing, working with organisations who are um, part of that change and, and help us and support them with some of their narrative and some of their stories. So the, the, the focus of today's webinar really kind of starts from a series of stats that were released uh, earlier on in the year, uh, and particularly from my old employer, um, the Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management. And the work that we did when I was at the organization was talking to organizations about what their plans were for the future. And, and there was two stats that really stuck out for me in all of that. One was that of the, of the respondents, 84% of people said that they were planning to move towards a flexible work strategy. Now, that was kind of coupled with another statistic that said that about 60% of people uh, were expecting that from their organization. If they didn't get it, they would be looking for employment elsewhere. So there was this sense that um, there was this kind of pressure to, to create flexible arrangements. Alongside that, though, 58% said that that comes with it, uh, a reduction in the amount of space that workplaces occupy. Now, that's before we even start getting into the nature of those spaces and the needs of those spaces. But generally, the, the, the consensus is the places in which we work are about to change. But that that's easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. And, and how are organizations going to manage this huge change management project um, that will impact not just the spaces we occupy, but it's going to impact the services we provide to our employees, many of which just become the staple of employee engagement and employee experience strategies. Um, it's going to impact the commercial contracts that underpin those services. It's going to change the way that we develop our policies. It's going to change the way that we form and manage our culture. So in our last episode where we were joined by Chris Kane, who's a, a prominent corporate real estate uh, commentator, um, we were joined by uh, Dan Gardner, who's a workplace designer, and we were joined by Megan Phelps, who's a uh, organizational development, uh, development specialist. We looked at the, the macro environment, the big ideas, the big challenges that we're about to face. But what this episode is about is going to the heart of the practicalities of it. So I'm pleased to say we're joined by Patrick O'Farrell, who's the head of FM at Nationwide, uh, and Derek Ziver, who is the Associate Director uh, for Workplace and Facilities on a global level for SEMA uh, and the I AICPA. And we're also joined by Open Sensors CEO and founder, Yodit Stanton, who can give us a bit of an overview of some of the conversations she's having with organizations about some of the challenges they're about to face. And where I want to start, I think, and, and Patrick and Derek, I'm going to start with you and Yoda, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of take a kind of a, a broader perspective from yourself afterwards. Before we dive into some of the practicalities we're facing now and in the future, I just kind of want you to cast your mind back uh, across the last year, which might not be the most pleasant of experiences for you, but um, just to cast your mind back um, uh, 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 when it was clear that things were, were moving very quickly and we had to make some very quick decisions. Um, what, what were the sort of principal um, challenges? I mean, we, we could all guess what the considerations are. They'll be around safety, it'll be around about, um, you know, particularly from a building point of view as well, they will be making sure that some of the buildings have got the right um, uh, services in place for it, because it's just as hard to manage an empty building as it is a full one uh, sometimes. Um, but you both had very different challenges so Derek you'll be looking at it at a global level at you know different different phases of the pandemic in different parts of the world and Patrick you've got to think about office and and retail so I'm just really interested about some of those challenges that, that, that perhaps feel a little bit unique to your roles as opposed to the general ones that we've we've talked about so maybe Derek if you could just start off about um that sort of pan that initial pandemic kind of impact on on the organization what your focus was yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm responsible for um, around 30 offices um, you know, globally. Uh, so our offices um, span across the US, uh, Asia PAC, EMEA. And um, what, what we saw with the 
pandemic was that um, in, in different locations, people uh, or governments were responding differently as well. So the, the levels of lockdown were different, were, were more st were stricter, especially uh, like, uh, you know, for my colleagues in, in Southeast Asia. So as an organization, um, what we actually decided to do was we, we just put our people first, you know, the well-being of our people first, the safety of our, of our people first. Um, and we also kind of thought globally, but acted locally. So we created a framework that said, okay, um, you know, we know, you know, people are reacting differently. However, um, you know, organizationally, this is what's important. So organizationally, you know, it's important for you guys to be safe. It's important for you guys to, you know, uh, to, to, you know, to, to also contribute to the community by, by not spreading, spreading the, you know, the virus within the community. So we're not going to make you go to, you know, to offices and things like that. And what that resulted in was we're asking questions such as, you know, the tasks that you're, that you know, would normally do in the office, can you do them remotely? Can you do them at home? And what do we, what can we do from a facility workplace perspective to help support those tasks? So already, um, you know, behind the scenes, I would say um, th there's some questions that weren't being necessarily asked um, literally, but, you know, at the back of our minds, we're thinking, well, you know, do people really need to be, to be in the office? And, you know, to people, you know, so, you know, when my colleagues, a country manager would say, yep, I would like to open offices because I have to meet my clients and things like that would say, well, do you really have to meet them face to face? You know, um, in terms of the things you need, uh, the physical assets you need to, to uh, you know, maybe uh, print or, or, or do all those things. Can we not, uh, you know, provide you, you know, the, those things at home? If we couldn't, can we at least um, provide limited access or, you know, or, or get them couriered to you? So, there were different types of conversations that were happening uh, depending on on how you know locally you know people were dealing with the pandemic and another thing to also bear in mind is that um, especially in that part of the world uh, some of our younger staff they lived in multi-generational households so for them they had the double whammy of obviously trying to you know can be productive and everything else but at the same time they were also worried about, you know, uh, you know, the impact on their on their grandparents, the impact on their on their on their parents. So, as an organization, as I said, because we're taking a people first perspective, we're also saying, okay, what can we do to actually help you navigate those, uh, you know, those, those those challenges? I know I do go on and on and on, so feel free to stop me, Chris, if I'm going off tangent. No, no, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting because there's, there's so many things. I guess it's easy for us to. You know, particularly being based in the UK, we, we've got a very UK centric version of, of the pandemic, you know, for, you know, talking about myself here, but you, you, you had to try and balance a lot of things up. But it's interesting you say that it was a kind of a, a people first decision and it was kind of immediately, it was quite easy, I guess, at a decision level to say, look, don't come into the office, you don't have to. But Patrick, there's certain aspects of your business where that wasn't an option, was there? So it, 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 it sort of turns it on its head a little bit. It's, it's to say, how can we carry on? as we are safely within the guidelines doing the best for our people, but also the best for our customers who will have sort of financial needs. And, and, you know, so that the, cause you're, you're providing a very critical service, aren't you through your retail operation? Yeah, absolutely. So um, just, just building on what Derek said about work operating in different countries, of course, we've got different devolved governments as part of the UK. So once we got into it, we were actually dealing with different rules in, 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 in different locations. But, but on this on, on, on the details, so clearly people were our first priority and making sure that they were safe. Um, allowing people who were vulnerable, who were identified as vulnerable, th the permissions to stay at home and creating those um, support blankets or support structures for them. So, so, so people were absolutely our number one priority, but very, very quickly followed by services. Because as you say, as a financial services organization, we had to be there. We were very quickly identified by um, the various government agencies as a critical employer. So we very quickly had to get a whole regime in place to produce certification. We had to identify within our organization who would be a critical key worker and who wouldn't be prepare certificates. Sounds like a small thing now, but it's a great big exercise for us. Um, and then, and then we had to deal with the broader societal impact um, on people's financial, um, uh, personal finances. If I give you an example of what it meant for us, uh, on a typical week, we might get 
um, 200 requests pre-pandemic for people to take mortgage holidays. So people who've suffered financial stress one way or another, um, lost their job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the first three days after lockdown was announced, um, we had 30,000 requests for mortgage holidays. And you have to respond to that. Some of the responses would be within a regulatory time frame. So it was very, very quickly mobilizing different parts of our organization and making sure that people had the technology and the capability to be able to respond in a timely manner, manner to folks. So there was massive operational problems for us, massive safety problems for us. And then, of course, we had the problem everybody had of getting hold of um, some of the PPE equipment and getting hold of it in enormous bulk so that we were able to support all of the locations that we have across the UK and, and make everybody feel safe so that those who had to come into work felt that they had the necessary tools and equipment to be able to work work safely. Thank you for bringing me back there, Chris. <laughs> it's, I know, I am very cautious, but we, we don't want to spend too much time talking about what is, is you know, very, very difficult period. And I, I suppose it was presenting challenges that, that teams that, that are very used to providing workplace experiences and services and stuff had to do something that none of us were trained for um and and you know i had this sort of um this uh, uh image of of people dusting off business continuity plans that haven't been touched for decades just to say you know what does it say when there's a pandemic and we've not really really got the the playbook for it and go to just to come to yourself i think my my mind when i talk to organizations that have multiple clients that provide a, a specific service. I always wonder what what those phone calls were like early on that said, you know, how can you help us? Or here's what we need help with. And and you know, so what were those what were those early conversations that you were having with clients as as it was becoming clear that we were facing a challenge unlike many have ever seen in their career? Yes, it was it was definitely interesting. Um, so we had two types of clients, like there was there were subsections of, of organizations that were um, essential workers. So they, you know, they, we, we shouldn't forget those that have actually worked through the pandemic. Um, and for them, the focus was very much around, you know, A, figuring out all sorts of details about the virus. Um, so we um, really kind of quickly went from understanding it's not about necessarily cleaning but it's a lot about indoor environmentals and then recommendations started coming out from different governments i think germany and and perhaps singapore as well they, they were releasing kind of um guidance around fresh air and, and, and ensuring that air circulation is up and so at the same time as these essential organizations were really kind of um carrying on in, in the best way they knew how um, and, and implementing kind of social distancing, they were also learning with us um, the, the science behind it all and, and how to, how to um, create safe environments. So I think with them, we were able to kind of, um, I think <laughs> in a way they were the test as it were for, for yeah. Uh, the folks that are now coming back and yeah. really now um, or over the last six months have, have they, they've kind of opened the field for them so I hope that makes sense it, it was there's two types of organizations that we need to um, really be mindful of yeah uh, one, one of the things and uh, you know I, and as an organization that does what you do I kind of felt like data was probably one of the heroes of of the pandemic uh, on a lot of levels. You know, we saw a lot of data on our TV screens every night um, that's looking like you were saying, like, as we we're learning more about the virus and its patterns. But from a workplace point of view, particularly, I guess, as as, as people started creeping back into the office and that, you know, we had to be careful about capacities and stuff like that, then, then people would have a, a sharper focus on data, which, you know, from my own personal experience, I kind of feel like workplace data was very fashionable, but per perhaps, organizations weren't using it as well as they could and 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 perhaps that was one of the up uh, upsides of of the what we've just been through is that actually there has been this sort of laser guided focus on the role of data good quality data moving forward which is something we want to talk about in episode three but i just wondered whether you know you could touch on a little bit about whether you did see that kind of thirst for data suddenly kick in as people started trying to navigate quite a confusing picture 
Yes. And it's not just kind of one type of death, it's multi-dimensional, which is which is quite interesting. Um, I think <laughs> everything brings complexity, like hybrid working brings a lot of complexity and, and being a lot more data focused helps. And, and I'll explain one at a time, but, um, and then COVID in itself has, the kind of the virus transmittability and, and so forth. Code safety um, is, is affected a lot by environmental and invisible. Um, yeah. So that becomes really crucial. So environmental data previously was kind of quite low down people's priorities, frankly, it was it was a nice to have from a wellness standpoint. But now for anybody that is um, that is operating an indoor environment, indoor air quality is, is quite critical, um, whether that's yeah. with schools or, or um, you know, kind of office buildings. Um, so multi-dimensional data and then and then the subjective data around asking people what they want. You know, now that you know you're working from home, you know, most employers had to really focus on how does this change and how do we engage with employees and get the feedback. So there's the subjective data, the objective data around the environment and, and then utilization, obviously, with in terms of managing capacity. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the environment went from simpler to just the complexity ratcheted it up. I, I think that's a fair, a fair summary of the of the pandemic, wasn't it? As well? <laughs> Derek, yeah. you, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I just wanted to come in um, just to kind of add uh, you know, to, to, to your this, uh, point around data. So one of the th interesting things I've observed is that you know, previously, uh, the only people interested in like data utilization and, you know, air quality testing, that kind of data was people like myself, you know, like, you know, uh, workplace professionals. However, now, you know, the proverbial, you know, John Doe sits, you know, <laughs> in an office, you know, is also interested, you know, so people, so our, our staff, our colleagues are now asking, okay, guys, uh, I want, I want the reassurance that the office is safe and you can't just tell me it's safe, show me the data, you know, so those kind of things are, are, are those kind of conversations are actually starting to happen, you know, within like people who traditionally wouldn't even care about you know, no, you know, air quality data, or they would just turn up for work, you know, have a coffee, you know, the, most of the things would worry about was the quality of the coffee. Now it's about the air quality. Now they want to know, <laughs> okay, Derek, yeah. you know, how does our air quality compare, you know, uh, pre-COVID to, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, I'll feel safe coming to the office if you can show me that, you know, the office is, uh, is safe rather than just telling me that it's safe. So it's quite, I just wanted to add that, um, that uh, perspective as well. Well, I think it's an it's an important point because I re I remember talking about employee expectation around this sort of stuff years ago, and that was, um, you know, I've I've got I've got young kids, I've got a nursery, I've got a little thermometer in there that gives me data on the temperature and the humidity in there, and I can see it tracked over time. Now, there's nothing stopping me from taking that little gizmo, which is about ten pounds, and sitting it on my desk in my office, and then marching up to your office, Patrick, and go, "Hold on a minute, I've read an article that says that the optimum opt uh, humidity for this and for that, and you're not providing that." And so, do you think, off the back of the pandemic, there's very specific um, things that people would care about um, that, that Derek's mentioned, that Yodit's mentioned there? But I, I'm just wondering generally about employee expectation and how that's changed. Because, you know, if we we're going to start looking at some of the practical things that's come up, one of the things I kind of hypothesized in, in some other work that I did is that the dynamics of the power equation between employees and employers has kind of shifted slightly, particularly when it comes to workplaces, because up until up until the pandemic, you know, I think, again, IWFM data shows about 60% of people were going to do five days a week in the office, fairly standard. That's now looking like 30%. We're now saying, look, flexibility is, is the key to all this. So now we've got to work harder to try and attract people in if that's in, you know, indeed what we want to do. And there's a question mark over that. It's not necessarily what we want to do. But uh, just, Patrick, your thoughts on some of the things that Derek and Yoda have said around that kind of it employee awareness about some of these factors but also the expectation and and whether or not you think that's going to see a shift in how organizations view their responsibility for the the environments that they provide people both within the corporate space and outside of it 
Sorry, that's a massive long question with lots it of points. A, and there, I'll right? try and break it down a little bit if I can, Chris. So, so just, just on, on the subject of, of data, what, one of the things we had to do very early on, particularly for those who were coming into our admin buildings, was to reassure those who were coming in that the buildings were set up safely. Um, so, so from a data perspective, we very, very quickly deconstructed our buildings down to various spaces and floors. We, we calculated where what COVID safe distances would be for people who were working. We blocked up all, all blocked off all of the other desks, and then to manage demand coming in through the front door, we built a bit of a Heath Robinson desk booking system until we could go out to market and actually um, um, buy the one that we're now we're now using. And, and we, we put limits on our buildings. So um, one of our buildings in Swindon pre-pandemic would have had a capacity, well, actually an occupancy of about 4,200 a day on average. Um, we maximized the uh, capacity to just over a thousand. And in fact, we had about 300 people in. That number's up to about 600 today. So we had a desk booking system and that desk booking system then allowed us to feed off that to manage some of the other things like sizing services and, and that sort of thing. Um, and what, what, we, what we introduced then over the last few months was larger groups coming in and groups of people coming in and doing a whole series of experiments to understand whether the space that we're providing for them is fit for purpose. So should we, should we create more flexible space? Should we create more collaboration space? And indeed, what, what does that look like? Pre-pandemic, pre if you came into Nationwide House, you would have seen like lots of buildings, I guess, apart from Google and the likes, you would have seen lots and lots of desks. Even in Google, actually, if you go behind that door, behind reception, yeah. lots of desks. But um, <laughs> so lots of desks, lots of collaboration space, and some meeting rooms. If you go into Nationwide House today, it will be different. You'll see more collaboration space, more social space. And I suspect in 12 months when you go in, it'll be even more. Um, and what we've, what we've created is this sense of, we call it imaginatively team talk, where we're just constantly getting feedback, constantly getting an understanding of what people want to use the space for. And we're responding to that um, and, and building new space. So data is incredibly important. Yeah. Just just quickly, just you, you sort of mentioned some of the, the numbers there about what you would expect prior to the pandemic in terms of that. One of the questions that's come in, and, and I'll be interested in in, in Derek, um, your 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 kind of feeling on this is that is that the patterns that we're starting to see in terms of of how many people are working from home and not are obviously been exacerbated by the, the pandemic, but what were they like before? I mean, what, as a, as a kind of rough guide, what sort of percentage of people would you say typically did uh, one of the metrics I, I've used is, is work from home at least once a week. So, you know, it might be one day, it might be an afternoon, but on a weekly basis, they would do some work from home. How, how, you know, as a rough guide, would you say how many people did, did that prior to the pandemic? So, um, in our London office, and in fact, in our US offices, um, Friday uh, was always a, a for, more, for many people, uh, was, was the quietest uh, day. So if you wanted to actually have some peace and quiet in the office, come on a Friday. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so, and then uh, in our offices in Asia Park, was slightly different because culturally, um, you know, things kind of work differently. So people were pretty much Monday to Friday. Uh, but um, I think there was, a, there was an evolution going on uh, anyway, so there was a there was a slow kind of evolution whereby um, you know we were calling it different things. So we our, our 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 philosophy was agile working in the London office. So Chris, I'm sure when you came to our office a few years ago, uh, yeah. you saw that you know open plan, and then you know people choose where they sit, you know depending on the task they're doing. Um, if they want to do some focused working, they could work from home. That could, we had that flexibility built in. Um, but then you know different people were calling you know agile working it meant different things flexible working meant, meant different things i think what the what the uh the pandemic has actually done for us is it's brought in this new word called hybrid which is actually what we were doing anyway you know what i mean so we were already working in, in a hybrid way it's just that hybrid has now become um kind of a lot more it's kind of formalized um, yeah. how we were working so the, the missing word is now is hybrid that's that's the word well, we we're missing it, uh, five years ago actually maybe not formalized it's popularized it hasn't it Popularized it, 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 yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. You know, it's like you were saying joe bloggs is saying I'd, I'd like to work in a hybrid way i mean i'm not a massive fan of the word to be honest from a 
it's like almost like a strict academic point of view. I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm not sure it's quite as accurate as it is. But um, but I, I think you're right. Is At least it started a conversation. Patrick, how did it compare? Because, you know, you guys got a lot of press for some of the work you're doing as well, you know, in terms of the decisions you made. But how does it compare in terms of the how much of a shift was it for your organization to, to work in, you know, as Derek says, in, in an a agile way? that some organizations did anyway before the pandemic was it a big shift <laughs> it was enormous um right. so so it was you know similar to what derek was saying on a friday was a good day to go in if you wanted to get uh, um, uh, lots of space but uh, particularly getting a car parking space but the um the the numbers in nationwide were probably in single figure percentages of people who f- formerly worked from home it was it was it was very small um and now it's it's enormous. I mean, I don't I don't have the number to hand, but it's yeah yeah. You know, if you if you if you take take nationwide house, which I just mentioned, four thousand two hundred, there's about six seven hundred people in there of a day. Um, the rest of them are all working from home, so it's right. a massive 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 change. Massive twenty four by seven focus from from IT, from risk people, from compliance people, from governance people, just making sure the environment is right for people to very rapidly be able to work effectively from home. And and you know, did you see that? I've got this uh, image in Open Sensors Towers of you guys with a massive dashboard, just seeing the nation's offices and all their all their uh, all their uh, occupancy data sort of going up and down. But have, have you guys done some work to see what the kind of generic aggregate kind of patterns are? Have you have you seen that kind of? It must be fascinating to see that kind of shift happening across the board. Yeah, and and it, it has been fascinating actually, and it supports a lot of what. Patrick has said regarding the type of space. So even if when people go in, the purpose for which they're going into the office is different. So they are going in to see others, to collaborate. It's less desk heavy and much more of a, of a, of a, a strain on, on actually the collaborative spaces. And what we're seeing is even with the meeting rooms is much fewer people going into bigger meeting rooms because so many of their colleagues are remote. So when meetings are conducted, you know, you've got kind of sporadic uh, distributions of people using any space they can to collaborate with others that are not necessarily in the building. Yeah. I think the composition of offices are, are, are you know, they're going to continue, but the composition of what the office looks like is going to evolve, I think, significantly. And, mm-hmm. and we're just on the probably the early stages of really understanding what that would look like. And and also behaviors are driven by others. So the more people come in on certain days, the more there is motivation for team members and their colleagues to go in on on that day. So let's not forget that other people's behavior drives their colleagues. uh, Yeah. Well, it's it, it's kind of community behaviour, isn't it? You know, people people start to adapt to that. Um, that's a nice segue into another area of exploration I'd like to go into because um, you're talking about the spaces in inside the the concrete blocks are going to change, but you know, within particularly in the world of real estate, that those cogs, the the interior of buildings and the and the shells that we buy and and occupy and stuff like that, all these cogs move at slightly different speeds. But the one that we we haven't really spoken a lot about, I think, generally as, as a community, is location decisions. Now we've talked a lot about the the interiors and how they might change, but location decisions. And it what it brings to mind for me is that you know you've got the you've got um, people like Spotify that are saying work from anywhere, do whatever, and it's like, well, okay, so hold on a minute. That then work from anywhere also could mean talent from anywhere, and if it's talent from anywhere then what provision do we put in to provide corporate space to support them in other spaces that might not be owned by us, but might be, I don't know, a WeWork or an office group or Regis or something like that. And which is Spotify's approach, really. They're saying, come to one of our locations, go to someone else's location on us or work from home and we'll support all of them. But there's still, there is still a need for some sort of presence somewhere. So Derek, let, I, 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 I imagine it's a, it's a big headache for yourself because your location decisions will be based on partly where you've got communities of members and and a, a kind of critical mass um that, that dictates that you need an operation in the country you'll have slightly different cultures 
that that have different attitudes towards working from home and all the rest of it you'll be you'll be impacted by the the market for co-working space and stuff like that so how how have you started to see any have you have you started to see any change in how you make some of your location decisions long term without giving anything away in case any of your employees are watching and, <laughs> and worrying? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to set a riot or <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think I think we uh, we've always kind of um, you know when leases are coming up or when we're thinking about you know we've always asked those questions you know what do we need uh, the, the space for and uh, to to. As technology has been, has been improving uh, more and more, we've realized that uh, to some extent, it's not necessarily the place that matters. It's actually about about the people, right? So if you if you want good quality, kind of like I would say maybe business development people, uh, the, the nature of their role is, I mean, they just want a place to come and anchor at some point, but then they're spending time going to clients, going, you know, traveling, going to doing presentations. So in those kind of scenarios, do we really need a, a big shiny building, you know, that kind of thing. So um, so we definitely are, you know, are putting more thought uh, in terms of why we need why we need the space. And then that that will drive, you know, some of those property type of um, of um, you know decisions, but definitely uh, one of the days where you kind of just, for example, you just renew at least for the sake of okay, we've been here for you know five years, we want to be there for another five years. You know, you might want to be in the same location, but definitely you wanna you know maybe you want the space to do something different, or you want a different uh, or type of space or more flexibility and things like that. So, so I guess what we're saying is that there's a sharper focus on on those decisions because you know for those who aren't in the world of, of property and real estate those kind of leasing decisions don't come around very often depending yeah, on the yeah, type yeah. of lease you've got right and that's yeah. one of the problems with the whole market at the minute is that those you've got to make 10-year decisions and and you don't know what's going to happen which is why we've seen a bit of a shift towards more of the flexible models like a we work and and uh, uh you know and co-working space patrick do you, you know just picking up on sorry derek's points there um do you say you know the two things i heard there as well were where you know perhaps the amount of space in a particular unit we might adjust based on actually we're going to take a new approach to work um there might be a kind of a move away from statement buildings you know there's a lot of organizations that you you kind of wonder what the real motivation is to have that enormous skyscraper with that's half filled but you know everyone can see it from a mile away um so there's there's sort of statement buildings that that looks like quite an expensive statement these days um but the other thing i wondered as well just to to add to some of derek's thoughts and, and then we'll get yours but um is that not only does do you have to consider the world of work, our employees' activities as part of that shift? But actually, particularly, for, I mean, I've got experience in professional bodies and that, like Derek, and the actual services that professional bodies offer now, you know, a lot of the legacy of these buildings will be like member lounges and places for members to come in. And that's becoming less relevant because people are working from home. We've got digital technology. And I guess you've had some of that historically from a, uh, finance retail business you know the the high street is looking differently and, and banking's become much more digital so I wonder whether some of your learning is has blended into actually the employee experience so again I have a habit of asking you multiple multi-layered questions uh claiming them to be a quick quick viewpoint yeah uh, exactly <laughs> <laughs> um so, so so we we yeah there's loads in there Chris and I'll try and focus in on one part of it yeah. if I don't answer correctly just just pick me up on it but we we talk in nationwide about um work is somewhere something you 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 do not necessarily somewhere you go um we've we've been uh fortunate enough to release some of our real estate we've we've let some buildings we don't think we're going to need them in the future um going back to what you said about some bold decisions i think that was a bold decision i think we've decided we are not going back to how it was um, before we will reinvest in this stock that we have retained and make it much more attractive for for people and fit for the, the work that they will be doing going forward. Um, you, you, you talk about the uh, location. We're seeing some real upside in location. Many of you on this call and maybe some of you on this panel will recall the days where you had a particular project or a particular strategy you wanted to execute. So your, your HR function would head off and they would find a location hotspots around the country and then quickly followed by your real estate people to see if there was space available. And then you'd, you'd, you'd sign a lease, you'd try and recruit some people and Bob's your uncle, you're stuck with something for, for 15 years. And now we can recruit wherever we want. 
and we can we can we can um, offer people the opportunity people who currently work for nationwide offer them the opportunity to develop their careers whereas in the past it wouldn't have perhaps been so accessible so so if you if you um if you imagine if you work in a branch in aberdeen and you were an absolute superstar um, and they're all superstars by the way in case any of them are listening but um if you worked in aberdeen and you were a superstar and you wanted to progress your career um in nationwide you might have to up sticks you know your uproot your family your social circle to move somewhere and lots of people did but i suspect it put a lot of people off as well what what we can do now is retain all of that talent all of that capability into our organization um, and and allow people to grow and develop based where they are now there might be a need once twice a week once twice a month depending on their role type to come travel get together with people they don't necessarily have to uproot everything that they they've worked most of their life to 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 do grow and develop. So for us, we're retaining lots of really good people. We're attracting lots of really good people because they don't have to be location based. So there are some upsides. But the, but there are I guess it the, the starts to present some challenges. And the, the challenge I, I can think of is actually related to the kind of quip that we made at the start of this this part, which talked about lease lengths and stuff like that because that that presents quite a fluid map of talent across a territory and you know we might you know you might sit there and go well actually 40 percent of our people are within 10 miles of this city so that's that would be a good place for that hot spot but then you, like you say you've still got to you know typically <laughs> sign a 10 15 year lease mm. and then it, it it fluctuates again and it's a different city that would be a great satellite um, so I guess what we need to see as well is some adaptation in the market as well about if we're going to have that fluidity of talent, we need we need the market to be fluid as well, because yeah, at the we, moment it's not, is it? No, we're, we're fortunate in so much as we have a, a, a retail estate yeah, broadly across course. the country. And in, in a number of those locations, we have the opportunity, um, should we choose to and should this develop as a strategy, we have the opportunity to create hubs or want a better expression where yeah. people can go and have a good experience if needed. That's right. I mean, I'm thinking about uh, one of your competitors on my high street in, in where I live, and it was a two floor space. And, you know, you don't need two floors in the retail bank anymore. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. so they've got some space there. Yoda, just on the location decision, because Derek mentioned size considerations, you know, you might you might have two floors and there might be a conversation that says, actually, maybe we only need one. I guess there's, there's a there's a danger as well as an opportunity there that you 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 make a sort of sweeping decision based on some stats that you've seen in the in the news about the amount of people that aren't going to tip up to the office in the future and and lose a floor but just just you know give us some of your thoughts on on how data can provide a, a kind of a uh, a vehicle to to get that size right and to make some of those location decisions that, that Derek and Patrick have talked about yeah, I think the, the the starting point on this is really segmenting the reasons why people need or, or, or their needs. So as an example, if you're living in a flat share and, and you know, the desk is, is your, within your bedroom and so forth, you are going to need a touchdown space quite regularly, either full time or majority of the week. And that could, I think that type of space could be facilitated by something quite local where you're minimizing necessarily transport, but it, you know, there is going to be a core group of people within most organizations that just cannot sustain full-time working from home for, for different reasons, right? So they have to be catered for as a, like, we're, we're going, just like marketing, we're kind of going into employee segmentation now, right? We have to segment that need. But for a lot of people as well, and, and, and again, there's a Venn diagram between those and the rest of, of the employee population, there's a collaboration focus to why people want to come in and when it's collaboration it's all about meeting your team rather than having space and for those kinds of working kind of styles you need the centralization because you know everyone from across um different places need to need to meet now that could only be necessary for depending on the team collaboration kind of styles once or twice a month or, or once a week and and so I still think that for me I, what I see is is the necessity for both um and it, 
I, I think the kind of the central place, and, and we do this all the time, that kind of, I think Zoom fatigue is becoming a whole dictionary term, but which is, we, we struggle to do quite in-depth new ideas, novel ideas, and, and really um, kind of take the organization forward remotely. And so we, we come together quite regularly, um, monthly, but that, that's enough for, for us. Um, and then the rest of the time is actually about individuals' needs. Um, yeah. And so I think it, it, it's going to be a mix. And, and yeah. But uh, I guess some of the challenges as well is, is you're right, the point out is collaboration seems to be the, the types of reasons people are saying we want to come together. Patrick's talked about that, you know, now and again, we'll want to bring you together for lots of different reasons. But um, those those sorts of spaces are quite space hungry as well. You know, they're, they're, they're not rows of desks that, that, that you, know, you get quite a lot of people in. And, um, you know, we've already mentioned Google and, you, you know, I don't expect everyone's going to be installing slides, but certainly going to try and create those sort of fun, collaborative, communi uh, community orientated type spaces. And, and, and you're right, we're going to have to try and find this balance and, and therefore organisations are going to have to understand their unique needs as opposed to uh, what I find quite frustrating. People are just looking for an answer. Just give me a ratio and I'll get on with it. And it says, well, actually it depends. It depends on your people, your organization. Um, look, we've flown through, the time has really burnt on. So we're just, we've just we only got a few minutes left, but one bit I just wanted to try and get a quick kind of sense of, and it's a question that's come in as well, is, is how we have seen during this period, the way we work, the culture of our work, the behaviors of our work, change uh positively and negatively because there's been some instances where people have talked about feeling more included um because you know uh, you know Yoda mentioned zoom fatigue of course not not right now I, I should imagine no one's got zoom fatigue at this very moment um but the um but people have felt like you know this sort of environment is actually quite uh, liberating because we're all equal we're all the same size we're all got the same amount of real estate on the screen um but uh, the question here is, you know, have we seen less toxic behavior? Because sometimes cultures in the office can be a little bit tricky. And I saw that in some data I did with IWFM where people were worried about going back to the office culture because they quite like being in their nice, safe home environment. So, Patrick, uh, come to you first, then to Derek. H have you noticed then, is there anything that stands out in terms of from Nationwide's point of view? We go, well, that's interesting. You know, people have started to do this and reporting more of that or worried about this. So we we saw during the pandemic, not 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 so much today, although it's higher than we'd like, we saw a massive spike in verbal and aggressive behavior with people coming into our branches. So this is the general okay, public. Yeah. And and our our colleagues, you know, so much so that actually we had 19 branches where we had to put um, a security presence in just to support the branch staff. I mean, horrific. Within within the um admin buildings and in fact within retail as well there's a massive focus on people's mental health and their well-being and being very very mindful that the situation that they're being put in that they have all the support they need to um either talk to somebody uh you know we, we launched an app to to everybody to give them hints and tips of how to uh deal with pressures uh how to cope with uh, isolation so there's a massive focus on that there's also a massive focus on inclusion um, and making sure that when we participate in these sorts of calls that people do feel included. If we have um, hybrid calls where some people are, are digital and some people are, are present, that people feel included. So a whole set of rules. The, the, the one area that we are um, a wee bit concerned about um, and we're, we're really watching out for, for behaviour is those people who've been in the office in this safe environment for the last couple of years how they will react when people start coming in and right. going out again and, and what their reaction is and how we can ensure that they feel that their safety is still being taken seriously and the people who come in aren't casual with their behavior towards these individuals who've, who've been in the buildings for, for, for a couple of years. They've got used to nobody being around. Yeah. So, so we're mindful of it. We haven't seen anything, but we're very mindful of it. And, and Derek, you know, something that that's, because what Patrick's talking about there, I guess, as well, is that there might be people that uh, are in the office that are there because they need to because of the home situation, but the kind of trade-off is that at least it's quiet so that 
because I'm I'm also worried about the virus. So, and then suddenly, oh my, you know, everyone's here, and I haven't really got another option. And it, it just sort of, as I was thinking about coming to you, Derek, um, some of my experience with offices and workplaces in in Southeast Asia and and, and places where you actually mentioned that there's multi generational people in the house, you know, the multiple generations in one house. It, it kind of makes sense because we we saw at the time there was less home working and there was a real focus on the office. Um, have you seen not only changes in behaviours and patterns, but have you seen um, in different territories where previously uh, understood cultural kind of norms have kind of reversed and actually surprised you about actually this this culture here, which was very, very not about homeworking and didn't like that kind of flexibility, has sort of embraced it. Have you seen any really interesting geogra uh, geographical uh, differences? Um. Yeah, I I've seen. Um, I, I think certainly, um, what we what has happened is because everybody has been kind of doing the same thing, so we've had no choice but to all be on a level playing field, right? And what is what that has done? It has actually challenged some of the kind of the, the norms, the so-called norms in in some of those places whereby, um, you know, um, we've said as an organization. We're okay with you um, not accepting a meeting request because you know I I am quite happy to you know if I if, if 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 I get a meeting request and I you know it's clashing or whatever or I have something going on I can decline or I can propose a new time but I have colleagues who will just accept 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 because it's coming from you know you know from the boss or from someone and I think what we've been able to do uh, be, you know we've been able to kind of take an organizational kind of like. You know what as an organization we want everyone to have the same experience therefore don't feel pressured you know to accept a meeting you know because i know some 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 colleagues would actually cancel a doctor's appointment because they have a meeting wow. that's popped up in their calendar so that kind of thing so we've been able to actually uh kind of thrust that out in a sense uh, because sometimes you know yes you know we 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 say yes of course think globally act locally but ultimately we are a global organization and you know right. we want everyone to be you know to 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 have some 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 form of equity in terms of how you know how they relate to the organization so yeah so i think that's been one of the things that has actually happened in terms of um kind of leveling the playing field so to say yeah yeah it sounds to me as well it's kind of almost uh it's giving people permission to, yeah. to to work in a way that that's that's comfortable and suitable for both you know we've got to balance the the needs of the organization of course but also people are people at the end of the day so uh, what a lovely lovely thing to finish on uh, Derek you know this idea that actually we might be entering a phase where uh, let's hope people don't feel like they have to cancel doctor's appointments uh, particularly because they're so hard to come by these days as well so uh, uh, just just to have an internal <laughs> internal management meeting so uh, look we we uh, believe it or not we have flown through 45 minutes of of insights and practical experiences from the pandemic we set out on on this webinar panel to uh, try and understand you know underneath the headlines uh, away from some of the, the the stuff that we read, the big the big kind of stories. Actually, what does it feel like on the ground? What does it feel like um, in the shoes of the people that are trying to make this new world of work work? Uh, I think we're all accepting it's a little bit of an experiment, and we're trying things out, and we're we're open to that, and we're open to some things working, some things not. But it's um, it's this sort of dialogue I think that's really important. So, um, Patrick and Derek, thanks for for bringing your practical experience. To the to the panel and, and for telling us about some of the experiences that you had both during and and as we hopefully emerge uh from this pandemic and thank you yodit for joining us and and giving us some of your insights from some of the conversations that you're having with your uh clients and and uh and, and colleagues so that brings us to the end of this webinar and um, you can find out more of the next episode which is going to get into the specifically into the role of technology data and tools that, that can help with all this in episode three but you can find out all about that uh, on the open sensors website um, but for now have a lovely weekend everyone stay well uh, and uh, i look forward to seeing you uh, soon cheers bye-bye